Immigration applications dropped by 50% in the first two months of 2023. Multiple factors impacting this. Some people are claiming that the strike is just meaning that they're not seeing the data. They're not processing They're not processing it, so the data is not showing up. But there's also an idea of it's extremely expensive to live here. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to find a place to rent or buy. Mm -hmm. There's more political unrest in the world as a whole. Our main driver of immigration was India. And India is having a ton of growth. I have Indian clients that have come here and be like, yeah, I made 20% of my house here. I made 100% of my house at home. So why, why, like, it's not that sexy for me to be here and I can't find a high paying job or be respected for the profession that I have. So why am I staying here? USA has made some immigration changes that made things easier. Yeah. So they're probably also pulling a certain portion down there. And additionally, like we've talked about USA with lower taxes, potentially easier to get a home. For sure. And a lot of these people coming from these countries, they don't like big governments and socialism and taxation. They come from a place where there's, I don't want to say it's, no rules, but it's limited rules. Yeah, and they come here and it's like, they can't find anywhere to live. They have to look, work crappy jobs way b- beneath their ability. Yep. And it's not like they don't have phones. They call back home and say, don't come here. Yeah, It's not that good. Yeah, And so here we are. And in fact, to be honest with you, I think if they don't do it voluntarily, the sentiment politically, federally, and just like general finger on the pulse, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people are saying like, I think when, when, we're when, maybe when bringing broke, too many had people in. Habits, uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits, uh. Welcome, 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 welcome. Master Keys Podcast, Chandler Halliburton. Neil Andrino. This is a podcast about real estate investing, life, wealth, life. all this stuff, everything that matters, everything that's important to you. It's important to us too. Is that everything that's important? No. That's most of the things that, that are important. That's the thing we kind of focus on. No, we talk about wealth creation um, with a kind of a, a real estate bent. That's the lens that we look at everything because we are real estate agents. We're the number one team here for Remax um, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and we're also landlords. We own a bunch of units. If you guys listen before, you know that. So we're going to talk about a lot of interesting things today. We're also going to have a guest on today, Neil. Do you want to preview our guest? Actually, uh, no, we're doing that for for Thursday. I always forget now that we do these two episode s- situations. Thursday, and we have a couple guests in the pipe, so I don't know which one it's going to be. Oh, So the preview is going to get edited not. onto this because <laughs> I don't know which one it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, a Monday episode here. Um, We're going over a bunch of stuff today. Yeah. A big one. That I'm probably going to hop into off the start, but no, immigration no. dropping by 50%. Oh, yes. I have, you guys have been following this. I've been screaming that the biggest concern for me is immigration. And then Chandler has echoed it recently because imagine moving here and you can't find a house. Imagine you can't find a house. Uh, you work a job that you're way overqualified for. Um, and generally everything that you were promised is not delivered on. Yes. Uh, BMO, their senior economist, is seeing that prices are going up. Let's go, BMO. So, and then we also have an interesting story about a landlord versus tenant story in Halifax with a surprise ending that hooped the landlord. I guess that's not a surprise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then also a little story about a mortgage broker who was flying private jets, living the high life, big fancy homes. Love it. Let's get them on. Well, looks like it might have been a Ponzi scheme. So oh! If you'll come on, I guess it might the be old, The yeah. old... You had me in the first half there, Neil. <laughs> uh, I've also got something that's kind of interesting. Those of you in Toronto will be interested in this. It was something I didn't realize, but there is this program in Toronto um, whereby if a developer knocks down an apartment building of six units or more to build condos, they then have, in, in recent history since 2007, have had to replace those apartments for those tenants for a period of 10 years. So if I knock down an eight unit in order to build a condo, I'd have to provide similar rentals for those displaced individuals uh, for, um, you know, similar in size and price for up to 10 years. However, that could be changing. And the reason is that there are some changes to this bill 97 and I want to get the correct title here. Um, So, Uh, Bill 97, which gives the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing the power to, quote, fundamentally change the city's current rental replacement practices. So under the current policy introduced in 2007, developers that plan to demolish rental buildings of more than six units must replace the existing apartments for tenants at the same size and provide similar rents for at least 10 years. Um, There's concern now that because the minister is going to have sweeping authority to do away with some of these things, that perhaps they will do away with that or soften it in order to spur on more development, more development, more development. Because I didn't know about this policy. I'm not in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can see is how that would be an obstacle to redevelopment. If you had a small-scale rental, and I say small-scale... That's a scale, huge obstacle. It's just another cost. All I can think in my head, I'm like, we did an episode where there's 30% of the costs are like taxes and permitting fees. 
I'm like, well, this is another major cost that you have to factor in on the next build. Like for 10 years, for a decade. And yeah. so you've got a mid-sized in, in apartment. Like a mid-sized in, in, in Toronto might be like a 20-unit building, man. Like that's, that's small. Then you've got 20 tenants that are presumably under market rents that you have to provide an apartment for. For 10 Does years. Does that apply to condo construction? Do you know? Well, that, that's specifically what it's for. Like if you're doing a replacement for condos. Okay, so then yeah. so saleable condos, then you have to then you pay people's rent in other places or you end up giving them a condo for the 10 years. Well, this is I think you'd have to figure it one way or another, but that's the most logical is you're gonna have to take a section of that condo development um and and, and provide them uh with units in there. Or um yeah, well, if it's so being torn out for condos, that's what have to do. 1500 bucks a month. And then like you said, it's a twelve unit or something that gets pulled down, that's eighteen thousand dollars a month for twelve months. That's one hundred and eighty. That's two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars a year for ten years. It's two point one six million dollars on top of purchasing and doing everything else. So it's just another yeah. two million dollar tax. Well, I mean, you would still be getting cost. the rental revenue, right? Like you'll put them into the space and they'll be paying you the rent. It'll just happen to be the same rent, which is presumably under market for these okay. Or condos. you have an alternative yeah. property that you own that you can move them into. If it's sorry, if it, okay, if it's, it's not you're covering the rent. In the yeah, meantime. yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're not covering the rent. Like they're just going to have to be provided units. So you might have a certain number of. But units how do you do that if you're a condo developer? You just don't sell like those twenty units. You have to keep but the it's, people. But it's in tough because a condo in Toronto, it's five hundred square feet, is worth eight hundred thousand dollars. So there's a good chance. Yeah. So okay. th- this is what, but what you're talking about is perhaps one of the reasons that in order to spur more development, they're thinking of of relaxing those rules, uh, which could be more. It blows my mind to think that you're tearing down a ten unit to build a hundred units, and they're like, whoa, whoa. Yeah, it's like not so fast. Pump the brakes there, big rig. Well, don't forget about those 10. And it's like, man, I'm adding 90 more on top of this. I know. This is the thing where it's like, what do you prioritize? Do you prioritize the individual or the common good of, of everyone? Like, yeah, that sucks for those 10 people. But we are saying we need more housing. And in theory, if we build enough more housing, those 10 people that have been displaced could actually go and find another unit for a reasonable price. But because we um, willfully oppose new construction and we stymie <sighs> new units at every turn Crazy. Um, that, that we can't reach that, that point. I don't know if I've gone on this rant yet. So forgive me. I know I've been gone, going on this rant a lot with a lot of people. Been on a few rants. The fact that we treat, you know, housing effectively like smoking, we just tax it so that yeah. no one will ever do it. Yes. we have been um, on this The rant. more I've been thinking about this, you've started smoking. I, I've just been chain smoking, <laughs> <laughs> uh, menthols only. Um, <laughs> It is a situation where the government does make more money in times of housing crisis. Like, they just do. Like, look at our local market here, man. Mm. Like, the housing prices were going through the roof, mm-hmm. right? And the city was like, this is incredible. Like, we ran a surplus you for the get first a time ever. You get a pool. Like, we're just mm-hmm. doing all of these great infrastructure things, like bike lane over here. Like, didn't ask for this, like, art installation? Who cares? You're getting, getting it anyway. <laughs> you get, like... Because all of the deed transfer tax was going through the roof. And property tax is going through the roof. And then, well, what happened was the market slowed down. The deed transfer tax started down. They're like, ooh, deed transfer is going down. Like, how are we going to get this money? Well, interestingly, our property taxes are going up, right? And they can get that because of the housing crisis and all of those high price sales. The real estate went up in value, so now they're getting it from property tax. So the governments do fundamentally make more money in a housing crisis than when they don't because the existing housing stock goes up in, in cost so much and they scrape away it from de transfer. So the cynic could say that governments that are more interested in padding their own coffers have a vested interest in there being a shortage of housing. Okay. Well, now that you've gone down this path, I'm about to try and have a really high level take on that same concept, uh, which is that basically the Canadian economy, like it runs on getting all the tax dollars coming in. We effectively finance that through the homes that we purchase. Correct. So, like, if you look at, like, a piece of land and then the home that goes on and all the taxes that get paid on all the materials and the labor, and then when it gets torn down and the new project starts and it trades hands all the way through, like, all that cost in that home as the years goes on is really basically baked up, baked, or built up from tax money that's going back to the government. And so we, like, they need prices to stay where they are, and we are effectively just financing a flow of cash for the government. Like, as the money gets given out and it goes back through the system, that's ultimately where it comes back, right? In those tax dollars. And that ultimately goes gets baked into the prices of everything you spend and buy. But day-to-day consumables, you can't leverage against. So the only place that they can kind of bury this repercussion, this tax, is within in property. But it's not in one go, right? It's over the course of 30 well, years. You keep seeing all of that, that go on to property valuations. And that's why they're backing 
uh, back in the housing market with things like CMHC and having to keep it afloat because it's really crucial to being able to keep our money churning around in a circle because our import export game isn't that great. Okay, let's just keep going. Here, here's oh, a little going down a big old route. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's a, that was a little a very example. Convoluted hard thing to explain. I'm trying no, to no, I, I, I know what you, I know what you mean. mean. It's it's circle and it's like a, a snake eating its tail to some, to some degree. Yeah, um, and we're just financing it like we carry the debt. So imagine a scenario where there's a piece of dirt sitting there, not doing anything for anyone. Yeah, and someone wants to build. I don't know. We'll say twenty units there. It's a nice piece of dirt, right? So this. There was no money coming. There, there was no money of any significance coming to the municipality, coming to any level of government for that piece of dirt to sit there. Small bit of property right? tax. So the government was, was living their life, running their budget off of one number. Mm-hmm. Now someone says, hey, like I hear there's a housing crisis out there. I'd like to do my part, and I'd like to build 20 units here. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, the government needs more money. Yeah. Somehow. They didn't need it before. Yeah. But now because, oh my gosh, you're building something there? We need, we need more money. In fact... We need 25 to 35% of whatever it costs you to build that. We're just going to, we're going to need that. Yeah. And their, their argument is, oh, the infrastructure is like, well, I mean, the lot was already here. There's already a road going by the lot. The infrastructure is here, right? So I don't really understand where the 25 to 35% is going. But for some reason, mm-hmm. as soon as someone decides to build it, the government needs that money from it. They didn't need it before, but they need it now. Mm-hmm. And so you build the unit and they take 25 to 35%. So let's just say 20 unit building, Neil, give me a cost. Uh, what's that? I mean, 300 a door, 6 million bucks. 6 million bucks. I think that's on the low end probably. But 25 to 35% of that is going to uh, different levels of government. A million and a half. A million and a half bucks. Yeah. Okay. Again, this was a million and a half bucks. No level of government had before, but now they have it. Somehow now they're going to spend it all. And right? the person who built it has to pay a mortgage on that. Well, not only mortgage, they're going to now pay property tax in perpetuity that is conservatively 20 times higher than it was before. Property tax. Right? So that, it, that 15 or that, that 25 to 35% that goes to government does not count the, the ongoing property tax, neither here nor there. So they've taken that 25 to 35%. What do they do with it? You would think, you would think if we were in a housing crisis, the government would do two things. They would say, you know what? We're going to waive the taxes provided you provide these at a proportionally discounted rate. If mm-hmm. we're going to save 25 to 35% on the fees, these need to hit the market at 25 to 35% less than they would have otherwise. Mm-hmm. And that's what bureaucracy should exist for, is to audit and mandate those sort of things and, and regulate it. That's option number one. 20 units just hit the market at, at 25 to 35% lower than they would have otherwise. Option number two, government says, it's okay, guys, we know best. We're going to take this 25 to 35% and we're going to put it to affordable housing on our own. Right. So they've just taken $1.5 million. They could, in theory, go out and build a more modest building, right? They could build a, you know, a five or six unit building. So for every 20 that the private sector builds, paying 25 to 35% tax, for every 20, there should be five or six, at least, free, built in cash by the government, affordable housing units built. Do you understand? Like, I agree with that, that you're math, saying. That math, right? You're that the math, math guy. Maths, yeah. Why do we get neither? We get neither. Well, they came up with a better, more clever solution. Oh, good. They Let's keep the tax it. money to do what they want with it. Yeah. Right? Which, I mean, there are obviously a ton of things that need to be provided. So I'm sure out of that million and a half, there's a portion of it that definitely needs to be utilized to service the extra 20 people that are going to live there, the bus routes, the water, all that kind of stuff. There is a portion of it that needs to go towards that. Technically, your property tax should be paying into that because you're paying annually. But Of course, that is what the property tax is there for. They've done you one better. Instead of taking that money and using it directly for something, the way that you can stomach it is they came up with CMHC. And so they give you a financing program that makes it feasible to actually finance at these insane costs to build. Yeah. They say, well, listen, so we, don't, keep we, the money. Like, we don't want to take less. Mm-hmm. We don't want to lose that 25 to 35%. Mm-hmm. So We're going to charge just, you an insurance premium. Let's, let's put some <laughs> convoluted, drawn-out, 50-year amortization, insurance policy-based financing. So It's feasible for you to build. It's feasible for you to build it. So we're going to build it at an inflated cost. But you know, even on those stretch-out amortizations... You can't keep those rents low. And in fact, you're not really that mandated to do it. Um, so we get no solution. They get more money. We get more debt. No one gets cheaper units. Exactly. This has been going They're through my mind They're also incentivized to have luxury units because you can't build affordable units and then pay those tax bills. But so this is what a big government person would say. Say, oh no, but like developers will never, they'll find a way around it. They'll find a way around it. It's like, well, that's where you should be directing 
the bureaucracy and, and the public sector say, no, you have to, we, you have to provide you know, a cost analysis of what you're charging to build these, these things. And if we're going to waive these tax implications, it has to be monitored in the same way the CMHC monitor stuff. So it is doable. But to finish the point, again, the government people would say, no, we're going to take that money and we're going to do great with it. But here's how tax dollars work. You give the government a dollar, they bureaucratize and gluttony it, and they give you back 20 cents worth of services. Instead, they could have either just built the goddamn, you know, affordable units to begin <laughs> with in cash. Yeah. And let's be honest, they would have built them probably in a more affordable level of finish to the new construction ones. Mm -hmm. Or just don't charge it to begin with. And we'd get way more housing. Think right now if there was just a, you know, even just a 20% reduction in, in taxes and fees on new construction, how there'd be an explosion of new construction. And that in itself would bring the unit cost down. And not only of the new construction, if you could buy a new construction home for 450, what is that going to do for all the resale homes around it? It's going to bring them down. Yes. It's not rocket science. What is the key cog here that's screwing it all? Is the government really, really wants that 25 to 35% that previously didn't exist. But now if it exists, they need it. Because it gives them strength as a government. And at the end of the day, the other thing that you need to look at is when you look at places in Europe, and places in Asia that have very successful governments and markets, they just continue extending the amortization to allow you to continue to finance this into it. <sighs> right? Like there needs yeah. to be a method of somewhere where they can put it and it, it keeps their economy in a stable place. And so I think that's the objective is to maintain a stable economy. But long story short, in these more stable economies, then you do have this problem of affordability. So Which isn't that the problem? Yes. Like, but we're doing these all these roundabout things to amortize this stuff till everyone's going to be long dead and gone anyway, just in order to keep effectively paying the government their pound of flesh on each one of these deals. The risky but smarter play, and it's panned out well for uh, a nation, is some of the Scandinavian countries, predominantly Sweden, made a lot of foreign investment, prudent foreign investment, after making a ton of money through uh, oil and gas exploration. And that seems to now have paid dividends for them. And now they don't have to, um, I think, be as aggressive on their taxation. Actually, even though they are insanely high on their taxes, and they provide a ton of amazing benefits and services, and they they have a good cash chunk that they're able to pull on when they need to. But anyways, anyway, this the, the, is the world we live in now. I think we can only harp on it for so long. People are like, all right, well, we live here now. Yeah, I, I literally just shit. had to add more parking to my car because that was an unplanned <laughs> rant. Yeah. Um, so I had to up You're assuming up you don't want to take it on your... Your dash. What's that? You're assuming. You oh, I already have dash. at least one ticket. I'm just. Yeah. I just embrace it. I assume I have the tickets. So yeah, I'm not that's money, money the government needs to. I parked next to the parking lady, looked at her, gave her the nod as if I was putting the money on my phone, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, then forgot to put the money. <laughs> proceeded to forget to put the money on the meter, and oh. am now just going to come out to a ticket. Yeah. And they increased the price too, didn't they? I don't know. It's forty five bucks. What? Forty five now? Forty five bucks, man. Yeah. Ho I just. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's forty five bucks. I thought, okay, I did one the other day that was 25. It must be different depending on the district. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's going up. Government needs that money, man. Oh, okay, well, that's just dampened my mood. I got a $45 bill right, sitting sorry outside. Sorry for that. Anyways, sorry, I stole your thunder there, man. No, I know no you got worries. some headlines here that you all good, all good. us. All right. Right off the hop, because we're going, we're going to what was firing me up. Immigration applications oh. dropped by 50% in the first two months of 2023. Yep. Multiple factors impacting this. Some people are claiming that the strike is just mean that they're not seeing the data. They're not processing, they're not processing yep. it, so the data is not showing up. But there's also an idea of, like we've talked about before, it's extremely expensive to live here. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to find a place to rent or buy. Mm -hmm. There's more political unrest in the world as a whole. Yep. Our main driver of immigration was India. And India is having a ton of growth. I have Indian clients that have come here and be like, yeah, I made 20% of my house here. I made 100% of my house at home. So why, why, like, it's not that sexy for me to be here and I can't find a high paying job or be respected for the profession that I have. So why am I staying here? USA has made some immigration changes that made things easier. Yeah. So they're probably also pulling a certain portion down there. And additionally, like we've talked about USA with lower taxes, potentially easier to get a home. Uh, there's also an idea that like, well, I can probably make even more money down there. And that's a big part of when you're making the move. For sure. And a lot of these people coming from these countries, they don't like big governments and socialism and taxation. They come from a place where there's, I don't want to say it's no rules, but it's limited rules. Yeah. Um, and they come here and it's like jeepers, man. So you're telling me I've got to, you know, 
like we're I'm, we're in this socialist country, but I also can't find a place to live, right? Like it's we 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 talked about this. We over promise and under delivered, and we thought that just because we're Canadians and we're nice, these people would come here and be like, "Oh, okay, it's so great here. <laughs> all these miles of coastline, like all this crap we like to tell people about how great it is here." Like they can't find anywhere to live. They have to look work crappy jobs way b- beneath their ability. Yep. And it's not like they don't have phones. They call back home and say, don't come here. Yeah. It's not that good. Yeah. And so here we are. And in fact, to be honest with you, I think if they don't do it voluntarily, the sentiment uh, politically, federally, and just like general finger on the pulse, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people are saying like, I think we're maybe bringing too many people in. Well, we just don't seem to be able to to keep up. Like they like we just talked about with expenses and everything like that. We can't seem to keep up. And so, like you said, sentiment here is also not great. They, this, so this is a Better Dwelling article that we got a lot of this information from. And they also mentioned that there was a survey conducted by StatsCan saying that one in five regret moving to Canada. Now, this was a few years ago that, that, that it was done. And I'd be willing to bet it's gotten oh, worse. Oh, it's definitely worse than then. And this again, this was done a few years ago. Two out of five were unhappy with finding shelter. It's probably four out of five now yeah. that are unhappy with finding shelter. Um, again, this is something to me that's been near and dear because I'm like, what's driving a real estate market more than anything else? People. You can have low rates, but there's no people here. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, it's that we've had this demand because there's so many people and all the people are immigrants. We are not reproducing at a pace that's causing this uh, in Canada. So to me, this is something that's super scary. On the flip side, the expectation is it takes a couple of years to feel this. So it's not like overnight now we're going to have this huge drop off. These applications are for people down the road. So right. we still have a ton planned for this year. This year is supposed yep. to beat expectations again. Um, but I think this is something that people should start having in their head. And I've been talking about it a lot. I talk about it with my clients is that like there's there's rent levels that we're hitting. And there's not necessarily just going to be like infinite growth for those because nobody else can go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Like there's nowhere else to go. Sorry. It's going to hit a point where we're going to start being like, oh, you know what? There's not that many applicants. And on top of people not being able to afford this, there's just not a hundred people that are looking for it anymore. We also like are not providing the sort of housing stock that they want or need. Mm-hmm. One, we recruit them over as families. Like we talked about on, on here. Studio apartments we have a bunch built. of studio apartments. Yeah, yeah. And they want to come over here as siblings or small families or two sets of couples. We don't build that. We don't yeah. build anything, but we definitely don't build that. We also don't provide roomy house situations because we stigmatize them. We thought, oh, that's no good. Well, why would anyone want to live like that? Those aren't allowed anywhere. Don't allow those mm-hmm. downtown. Don't allow, especially here in Halifax. Oh, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. And that's what they ask for. Like, hey, you know, why can't we just all rent a room in this building and share a common we're, area? We're comfortable with that. We've done that. Yeah. We, we, we treat it with respect. Yeah. And, and like, so, <laughs> you know, it just, it's, it's so weird that we just can't see all the dumb things that we're doing. And we just keep leaning into it and just keep doing it more and expecting a different result. And I don't know what the solution is, is going to be. Like, those are also the same things in some respects that we need for um, Canadians who have been here for a while. Like, young families are the most at risk in, in bigger urban centers because there's nowhere for them to live. Mm-hmm. And as a result, they don't have kids, which is why we need to bring people in because people aren't having any kids. So there's some cruel irony in that. Um, and also young people would probably really love a model that was effectively uh, a rooming house situation. Not mm-hmm. love, sorry. Um, would effectively need right now for affordability. So I just don't know what we're doing, man. I don't know what we're doing. It's it's hard to see. Again, I think this is something I'd like to start studying more, but there is something on a larger, full political scale. And I think it's understanding where the country's trying to go and can maintain its strength um, that I think sometimes we overlook when we're talking about this stuff. Um, but it's so high level. And sometimes it's like if you get so obsessed with the macroeconomic, at the end of the day, we're not big enough to even really be involved in it and you got to kind of watch what's going on 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 a micro scale but that to me again i just want to go back immigration dropping by 50 percent in the first two months of 2023 these are applications it's not people coming in so again you're not going to feel it today but it's something to consider the strike may be it but i think there's a lot more to it i think we we may see a huge resurgence well we likely will when when people go like the strikes are all finished people go back then you'll get a bit of a bump yeah. But then it'll be watching that number for the rest of 2023, what that looks like. Is but that also, are we going to lose some of the people we did bring in, right? Like, And then there's going to be an aspect of people yeah. that we lose that we've brought in. Yeah, I can't imagine what it's like moving from that, from a country, moving here, thinking it's like the promised land. And then you're like, I can't get a job. I can't find a place to live. Everything's expensive as hell. There's a shit ton of rules. Yeah. Well, I think they can get a job, but... I don't think they can get. But how long is that going to last right now? Because yeah. there's an ec- yeah. economic slowdown is, is real. 
like everywhere across the board, like savings are dwindling. People are spending less. Like the mindsets are changing. At the end of the day, people are just going to buy less cars, not even because they have less money, but they're like, I don't want to pay seven nine 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 on a car. I don't want to pay even on a house. Like we see it, there there was a slowdown in volume, right? Yeah. Like even though it's still strong, the volume is much much lower. Um, so and that that then spurs to like everything else. It's the same with all the businesses now. Uh, some are going to shut down. Some are going to charge more money, and and people are going to have less money to spend. So, anyways, I can rant about this forever. That's how I feel. I don't think it's happening overnight something to be cautious of i just want to say because i saw it and it's something i'm screaming about on the flip side Mm -hmm. bmo senior economists oh yeah are saying the pricing is going to climb again and the reason being the reason being is the list to sale ratio and so there are more sales than new listings and because of this on average the market's gone up but again, this is a blip in time. And so it's like how quick we are to forget. Like it just dropped off there a minute ago and now it's popping back a little bit. But like it, it could be just, it's a spring market. Like, I don't oh, think yeah, this but, is an indication I'm, that the listen, whole... I'm sure... It, one sec. Uh, on, on, the same, on the same breath, the banks are also saying that they're seeing more people fall behind on payments and delinquency rates are going up. So they're so, like, uh, it's yeah. going to the moon. And they're like, don't worry about what's going on over there. We're going to lose a lot of astronauts on the way. <laughs> yeah, don't but, worry. Uh, don't gonna, worry about all those defaulting mortgages. Nobody yeah. needs to worry about those. It's going to the moon. And Which I'm like, Apollo crashed. It's like, we're going to the moon, but to, like, not all of us To me, is it them there. trying to save face and keep people happy? Because they're like, there is so much sentiment out there nowadays. And they're like, all right, we're going to keep giving these press releases. Press releases. No, but like, I it's just all think good. It's all good. Like, we have to build more homes. Yes, we do. And we don't. So yes, the we do. price. No, we don't. Of the existing homes goes up. That is not rocket science. Are we building enough new homes? No. No. Does Is there any reason whatsoever, any reason to think that's going to change? Uh, not really, except for the fact that there are a lot of people who got into the business and there's a lot of people trying to make a go of it. In the, in you the, still need to get the land approved. You still need to have yeah, the yeah. trace. Like, so is there any actual reason to look ahead at the rest of 2022 and be, uh, 2023 and be like, oh, we're definitely going to build more homes than we did last year. The there's new- no reason for that. There's no reason to think that at all. So we need more homes. We're not building them quick enough. Ergo... <laughs> the existing homes are going to be more expensive. And yeah, there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of casualties of that. But that's kind of what happens when you rip through something that has some underlying shortcomings. Um, there's going to be some, there's going to be some, you know, carnage. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's a, that's, yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, so I guess maybe maybe home prices will maintain level and, and stable, but as a whole, I think volume will drop off a cliff and the overall economy is going to slow down. Anyways, I want to change into something. It's not necessarily funny, but it's an interesting story. It took place here in Halifax, and I'm just going to read the headline. Court awards tenant $15,000 of landlord damaged toy car collection. Whoa, 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 whoa. Say again? Yeah, so CBC News article. Court awards a tenant $15,000 after landlord damaged toy car collection. The That's landlord had appealed a smaller amount, ordered after a previous hearing, and then the final result was this. So, at a high level... Because of the dinkies. Yeah. So, the a Nova Scotia tenant had been awarded... One, this second, is Nova Scotia? Yep. And oh, yeah. the names are all on here. But the Nova Scotia tenant was awarded $1,371.15 for his security deposit, moving expenses... Furniture damage and loss because he was evicted uh, unrightfully or unlawfully. Yeah. Like it, okay. it, the landlord had not followed the rules. The landlord then appealed that decision, went back to court. And he brought in the... And he brought in an appraisal for his toy car collection to that new hearing. And it was treated as a brand new hearing. So he was able to bring up new damages that were found in the interim. And those damages were valued at $16,217. And so he was awarded fifteen thousand dollars. So the landlord could have got off with fifteen hundred, yeah, fourteen hundred, and instead now he's cutting a check for fifteen k. How did? What were the vehicles? What were the cars? And what was the damage caused to them? So there's a picture here. They're all in, individually bundled. And so he then those are those are dinkies. Right? Those are yeah they're, yeah they're Hot Wheels cars. Hot Wheels yeah. Hot Wheels cars. You, you called them dinkies. Is that a Nova Scotia thing? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it actually is because mm-hmm. I remember when I moved here and people called them dinkies. Um, anyways, he had a full collection of Hot Wheels cars and he had them all perfectly laid out. I guess when the landlord pulled apart his unit, uh, they threw them all in a garbage bag and put, and put them in a box. Okay, that's not um, cool. Yeah, not cool at all. And so then he'd taken them to an appraiser who's been doing this for 25 years and he appraised the collection at $21,500. But they had damage. And now with damage, they're worth $4,400. Man, I gotta check some of my dinkies at home. <laughs> um, I like micro machines. Remember micro machines? Yep, a hundred percent. It Man, uh, I should have taken better care of those. Yeah, this well, is this was pretty mind blowing. Um, and it's also and mess around and find out. Landlord. Mess around and find out. This was that same concept that you were talking about. Uh, we talked about with our guest is that like you can go to tenancy but the result is a result and you both have to be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this would be the same concept here. And to be honest with you, like I'm going to side with the tenant on this. Oh, totally, man. I also don't know how he didn't bring this up earlier. I guess it just kind of occurred to him after the fact. No, he, he brought it up in the first hearing, but he had no appraisal. And oh, so okay. without an appraisal, you going in and be like, my dinky collections were $20,000. They're like, you're not. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Nerd. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Uh, and so he's like, okay, no, that's fine. I'll go get the, uh, I'll get an appraisal. And again, this appraiser has been doing it for 25 years. So there was no jokes about what this was. Um, and it's also easy now with the internet. Like these, this is legit. Yeah, yeah. So I so also I, like, I, I've good, man. Like if he lost that value, man, that would suck. Collectibles are no joke, right? Collectibles are an interesting part of the economy. We should do an episode on collectibles. Um, I've been watching that show on Netflix, like King of Collectibles, Golden Touch or whatever, like that guy <laughs> and the LeBron triple logo. People Googled LeBron triple logo card. Like it was the most sought after card in the world. And people were buying these boxes for like 20,000 bucks on the chance of winning it. And as soon as the guys got it, they sold it 2.4 mil. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. Couples are interesting. The part that he bothers me on this even, like I'm going to really side with the tenant here, is the 15K is great for today to cover the lost value. But... Future value of the car, cars, yeah. Yeah. Because it's yeah. like anything once it's damaged, the future appreciation value. Because suppose, a lot of these things, like, as time goes on, yeah, yeah. the appreciation curve goes even crazier. And so he might have a few in the collection that might have individually been worth $25,000. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I now, because they're... Hard, hard to predict in the future, but it, it always well, is. And maybe, maybe they go down. Maybe they become worthless. Um, but I, I would have bet my bottom dollar that there's a new generation coming up that's going to want to buy some of those dinkies. I'd probably buy one. To be honest, I've been trying to find dinkies to match the vehicles that I have now. Uh, I think that would be sick to have a little like matching that one. That would be kind of cool, actually. Um, anyways. Yeah. What else you got? That's an interesting news story. Well, the other news article that I have, it's another CBC article. Um and it is a mortgage. Oh, yeah, this guy. You saw this? No, you were telling me about it. I'm, I'm excited to yes. hear about it. So I'm not sure if he's a mortgage broker. I don't know what's going on here. I've lost my article now. Um, oh, it's being brutal. But I'm going to have to then ad lib it because I don't have the article here. It was a mortgage company based yep. out of BC. And they were giving out private mortgages across Canada and looks like in part of the States with rates as high as 25%. Um, yeah, so very, I don't want to say, I'm not gonna say predatory, but just very aggressive. That's predatory mortgages. lending. That, that gets up there. That's, I think I don't, almost credit card rate. I don't know what the technical cutoff is for predatory lending, but my God, yeah, 25% it's gotta be there. Exactly. And he was accepting obviously funds from, from investors, uh, of all different sizes. So on top of having like capital companies, banks involved, he had, um, private individuals, investors handing in $250,000 effectively. Like, of course, this has been going on for many years. He now has hundreds, if not thousands of investors. So you have people who put it in their full life savings because they've been doing it for a while and been mm-hmm. receiving their payouts. Um, and at the same time, he was living a huge life, flying private, multiple giant mm. homes. How old is this guy? Um, it looked like he was in his mid-40s. Okay. Um, anyways, of course, the shit's at the fan. And now people are asking for their money back and he's not being able to do it. Um, the last transaction I think was for forty-eight million or fifty-eight million dollars out of the bank account. So the banking company said we saw a deposit of fifty-eight million, and then they pulled it right back out or something like that. And so that to me is also weird. I'm like, wonder if like what, do banks not? But I guess they're not really supposed to get involved in that business. But the money was withdrawn. They can't find him in Victoria, BC. They can't find him. No. Now he's still active online. As of a couple of days ago, he made a release and said, "No, like everything's good," and he was still soliciting for money. <laughs> He was still asking for investments. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, did you get the article here? Amazing. Thank you. Um, so that means, like, what are you doing? 
Yeah, so PWC just no. discovered $58 million was deposited and then immediately withdrawn. Um, in the last month, $3.5 million was deposited. $5 million was taken out. Um, and he has his own investment company that money was getting transferred to. So right now, he is owing investors $26 million. 50 investors attended the hearing. 350 watched online. Like, it's it's a fairly big case, and he's been doing this for a lot of years. Like, this is a very... And so is the allegation that he's not even lending this money out. He's just literally paying back investors with new money. Well, no, it looks like he is lending money out because people okay. were receiving were receiving debts. Um, and so I think that's why like the full amount look they're looking for is twenty five million because there is a bunch of secured debt that can be claimed on. Um, but it's really weird that his current bank account has two hundred and seventy four dollars in it. I mean, but he just whipped out like fifty million bucks that he transferred into his own. He's like, I'll send you e transfer for two hundred. How about that? <laughs> and some gently used dinkies. The, oh no! There you go. But my bigger thing, and the reason I wanted to bring this up, uh, thank you, is like you're going to see, I think, more of this during this time. We saw a couple other banks that have collapsed in the states, and and a lot that are faltering. Um, it's just to be cautious in what you do. I think a lot of people are really keen and interested in getting involved in the market or having their money out there. And it's like try and do your due diligence. And just because something's big or because someone lives a flashy life does not make it true and correct. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you should have the ability to ask for financials um, or where your security is. And if you're lending a big chunk of money, potentially a personal guarantee, things like that. And realistically, at the end of the day, a personal guarantee is not going to do anything if he flees the country. Um, but just knowing what that willingness is, is important. And so I saw that. It kind of kind of riled my cage. Um and it doesn't surprise me at all, though. And I think there's a lot of banks that honestly be in similar boats. And I think a lot of these people start out in a position of wanting to do the right thing. And they genuinely had a business model there. Yeah. And then when things start to hit the fan, then to try and keep it all afloat, to maintain not only a lot, I don't even think it's a lifestyle. I think a lot of people like to be like, oh, he just wanted to keep his fancy house and car. And I'm like, no, I think it's more like there's almost like a guilt and embarrassment that's involved when you have like hundreds, if not thousands of investors and you're reporting to that many people. Yeah, and you're letting them all down. I mean, yeah. at 25% interest, those are some high-risk lending products, and some people yep. are less willing to tell their investors, like, hey, yeah, that one defaulted. Yeah. And so we lost it all, right? Like, that's a hard conversation. Like, well, let's kick it down the road, and I'll just cover the loss, get yep. new investors, and then hope it never comes up. And then it comes up, well, now you have a harder conversation. You yep. lost more than the um, you know, initial high-interest loan. But... Um, yeah, I don't know, like the the rise in defaults that you mentioned, like BMO was talking about and the, and the uh, delinquency and all that stuff, it's, I mean, concerning is, is almost, I, I hate to use such a mild word, uh, but because those are real people having real struggles, but, you know, individuals on their own do not a market make, like it is the sum of the parts and still there's so much buyer momentum right now, man. Like there's still stuff going up and up in price and I think like we've got to level out here at some point. I, I think we're going to have a little run here. It's not going to be what it was. And I th- got to think that, it, you know, maybe at least outside of, of major markets, Toronto, Vancouver, the rest of the country has got to chill at some point price wise. But I don't know, man. Okay, I'm going to throw, throw, throw one more headline at you. I don't know what, what we can do. I'm going to throw one more headline at you that I saw that I thought was very interesting. I left Miami for a remote village in Pakistan. I have no running hot water and limited electricity, <laughs> but my quality of life here is infinitely better. Oh my God. That's some hipster bullshit. If ever there was, <laughs> let me show Come you the picture on, of the, the lady. Oh my God. <laughs> that, you, know, you live, you wear one of those big dumb hats, man. I'm not listening to a word you say. I, I do have one of those big dumb hats. Oh my God, Neil, <laughs> if you wear it, I'm just now, you. now that you've said it, it's good to be coming out. Um, <sighs> listen, if you can she, pull the hat off, Credit to you. She goes, no. I could definitely pull the hat off. She goes, I don't lock up my bike, my front door. I don't do that in Enfield, but now I'm going to lock my front door now that I just said that, but <laughs> yeah, um, I can walk everywhere and my recent major home renovation cost me three grand. Where's she living? Pakistan. I mean, I don't know how to respond to that. I, I, I don't know what it's like down there. Maybe it's lovely over there in Pakistan. I think the main idea is like safety, more chill lifestyle, and the cost of living is not out of this world. Let me see this granola. What's she doing for a living? I don't, I'm trying to see if she... Well, does she even have to work anymore? It sounds this like, like you could do, like, do a whole house like, like, for three grand. You know what? Like, like I live in this van now, and just my life is so good. 
I can't shower, you know, outside of a public space. Maybe, like, maybe honestly, maybe there is some merit to it though, because I feel like a lot of us are in this relentless grind. Oh, listen, man, totally. But I think there's some happy medium between grinding I think, nonstop well, I think, and I think moving this, to Pakistan. This might be a little extreme. This might be a little extreme. Yeah, and that's why I said oh, it. She must be the worst person to talk to at parties. <laughs> It's like, you know what's really great? Like uh, Pakistan. It's so chill now. <laughs> she goes, look, I stayed in hotels. Nowhere it costs more than $15 a night. She just stays in hotels? Uh, I think she's sleeping in her car. No, she has a house. Remember, she did a, uh, a giant reno for three grand. Giant reno. I'd like to see that reno. Um, hey, listen, I think we all need to find uh, some balance and remember what we're doing it for. And, um, you know, our time on this... Dude, they, they did renovated two rooms, added a bathroom with running water, and a Western toilet. And that was three K. Cool. Cool. She's not. You're not sold. Not weird. Flex, a meal at a restaurant okay. is usually two dollars. Seven dollars for Western food. Yeah. Listen. Unlimited data. Eight dollars. I think. Th- who knows? This we could have this crazy reverse migration that starts happening around the world, where people get out of you know Western capitalist you know race and go elsewhere slower pace of life and um i don't know what that would look like um but have at her i'm not going there <laughs> you're not going i'm not going but appreciate the thought. all right well that's what i had for today yeah it was a bit of a lighthearted one bit of a rambly dambly yeah so let, let's transition now um preview our next episode we're super excited we've got some interesting stuff so you know, on Thursday, tune in for that episode. We're going to be talking with Dennis Wilson. He's a top producing realtor in New Brunswick. A lot of you guys have reached out and asked us about New Brunswick, what's going on there, the pros and cons of the market. So we're going to do regular check-ins with a few different areas of the country. And we're going to start with Dennis uh, in New Brunswick, the Moncton area. Um, so check out for that on Thursday. Thanks so much for watching the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. Don't forget to subscribe. But also check us out on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all the links below. Thanks again for checking us out. Broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh.